good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and they put me on after Charlotte. I mean, you know, try and follow that. Amazing, amazing uh, presentation. So thank you all very much um, for taking the time to come and listen to me today. And what I'm going to do is take you on a bit of a journey, a bit of a journey, uh, my personal journey and the government's journey of fighting the COVID pandemic and how, what we did in Test and Trace. But most importantly, the lessons that we can learn and how we go forward with that. So going back to my school days, oh, it was a long time ago, um, history was, was one of my favourite subjects. And I, you know, apart from the Industrial Revolution, which was pretty much all I remember um, in terms of learning, there was a big banner over the blackboard. Yes, it wasn't even a whiteboard, it was a blackboard that said, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. You all know that expression. It's very well known. Lots of different people claim that they actually made that, you know, that, that quote, but, but that stayed with me, and it's really relevant for what I'm going to talk to you about today. So how did it all start? When did it all begin? So there I was, happily. I'd moved into government about four years ago from uh, the investment banking sector, and I joined Ministry of Defence, um, as one of the uh, chief procurement officers over there. Quite a different, uh, you know, from, from finance into, into defence. Absolutely love and it was fantastic. Still is, defence is still my home, home department. But then COVID hit, hit us all. And, you know, the, the remember in sort of the January, February stage, we were all starting to get quite concerned about this. By March, we knew we had a significant problem. And around that April time, as I was looking at the government's response to how we were coping with it, the PPE, the ventilators, uh, just the, the spread of this awful disease, I knew that I personally had to be part of the solution, not only being in government, but being, uh, you know, an executive in commercial and supply chain, knowing the importance that that was going to bring to, to the organisation. So part of the solution, I went forward, and as I said, I took up the position of Chief Commercial Officer within Dido Harding's um, test and trace driven organisation. So let me tell you a little bit about what test and, trace, test and Trace was and what it did. I think most people think they know what it is, but actually it's quite complex. So we were the government-funded service. We were the crisis response team. Remember back at that time, there was PPE. We all remember what was going on with PPE. We were building ventilators incredibly quickly using wonderful companies like McLaren and everybody else that were just coming together and we needed an adequate test and trace service to be able to, um, to, be able to print, uh, trace, track and prevent the spread of this virus. So we were part of the core recovery strategy. My job and the Exco's job in test and trace was all about recovery as well. It was to get as many people back to a normal way of life as quickly as we possibly could in a safe way and the whole time protecting the NHS, which was becoming increasingly overwhelmed, and the uh, social care service. Of course, the, the issue within the care homes, um, these are all things you know about. So what was our job? Our job was to identify, control, contain, reduce the spread, and ultimately, what I'm most proud of was to save lives. So we traced the virus, we tracked the virus, not just the people. You know, we, we set up one of the largest genome sequencing uh, organisations in the world. This was absolutely key. We isolated new variants. Again, back in sort of the early days, we weren't really talking about different types of variants. We all feel quite educated on it now. You know, we were calling them things like the Kent variant and the India variant. Then we moved to, you know, deltas and, and more scientific words. And, of course, we were the early warning on the increase, not only locally and in certain cities and towns, but also, also nationally and globally. So, I'm not here, I'm here to talk about the challenges, and I'm here to talk about the way forward. But if you will indulge me just for five minutes, just to really tell you what we did, because quite often tests and trace voice doesn't get heard enough, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. You'll enjoy my Piers Morgan story, I'm sure, so don't fall asleep. So, um, some of the things we achieved. Um, and forgive me for reading, um, I want to get it right. The numbers are really important, and I don't do slides, as you probably gathered. So, what did we achieve? So, we are still, today, providing and managing over 5 million lateral flow tests a week. 
that you've all probably got in your cupboard that you've all been getting free from um, the government, whether you've got children or not. 200 million PCR tests have been conducted. 200 million. We've identified over 4 million positive cases. 87% of positive cases that have been traced, and we've asked those to provide the close contacts to us. So that was around 3.4 million people. And 82% of those close contacts back in the stage we were at identified were asked to self-isolate. That was over 7 million people. You can start seeing the effect it would have had on the spread of the virus. We set up and ran 1.4 asymptomatic and 1.2 symptomatic test sites. And that sounds so easy. It's the test sites in the library, in the Asda car park, um, all over the world. A, 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 an amazing challenge that we set them up so quickly in such a short space of time. We established the largest network of diagnostic testing facilities in British history ever. So we expanded our NHS and our PHE labs, used all the university labs as well, um, built and expanded lighthouse labs like we did with the lighthouse hospitals, um, and we produced a, uh, the Franklin Roslin Mega Lab um, up at Milton Keynes, which is just breaking all records in itself in terms of how quick we put that construction up. So all of those labs, what does it allow us to do? It gives us the capacity to conduct over 600,000 PCR tests a day. 600,000. There's probably not a person in the room who hasn't had a PCR test. And hopefully you got really good, you know, you got it back either the next day or the next 24 hours. This was everything that we had to build. I've talked about the genomics capability that, that we raised. We got the world's best scientists, clinicians, uh, doctors, um, all working in our labs to fight this 24 hours a day. We set up 313 local tracing partnerships. So it wasn't all done just centrally. And I'll talk a little bit about this later in terms of challenges. We had to bring everybody, all the local authorities on the journey with us. Let's not forget our app. Whether you like it or not, ping, ping demic or whatever they refer to it, it was downloaded over 25 million times. And, and myself and the team, we, we had to get that, up, up, that app up and running within a matter of weeks, 25 million times. And it's still, it's evolved and it's still, um, uh, we've still got an awful lot of people, over 20 million still subscribed to that app. And let's just talk a little bit about the money. So 1.7 billion was district of government funds, our, our public purse was distributed to local authorities through the Contain Outbreak Management Fund. 176 million was distributed to, through test and trace support payment scheme for people that were um, suffering hardship, and 149 million to local authorities to support the adult social care. And then, you know, we had some really popular activities. So, getting the schools back last September, that's something that, that I'll remember for a long time. Um, getting the borders open last Christmas so that your turkeys could come in. Not that we had much of a Christmas because it was cancelled three days before. But these were some of the, the really sort of uh, real high energy activities. And then, of course, there were those activities that aren't so popular. So, for example, our managed quarantine service. If you come in from a red country, we will be putting you in a hotel and you will be quarantined for 14 days. And setting up the Joint Biosecurity Centre, uh, which obviously gave all of the uh, information on the red, amber, green countries. So I promise I will stop there and not, um, not continue to go on about just the amazing things that Test and Trace produced. But I'll talk a little bit now about the challenges. So I found myself, when I came over to work in Test and Trace as the Chief Commercial Officer, um, managing the largest and most complex spend in government at the time. Um, it, it, it was... It was an incredible size and scale of everything. We were in crisis response mode. Um, we didn't have the resource. Um, you, know, we, you just can't get those level of resource from the civil service and the current government environment. So we had a real hybrid of people. We had a, a massive percentage of consultants, which were just fantastic. They built Test and Trace. A very large percentage of contractors also built Test and Trace. It was a partnership. We were, at the time, we were still learning about the virus when I came across. We weren't sure of the prevalence. We weren't sure the number of people who had the virus. We weren't sure of the difference between symptomatic and asymptomatic and how to deal with this. 
So I came in in those early days of sort of May and June, and I had to establish incredibly quickly a very robust commercial service, an operating model, in a matter of weeks. I've set up commercial businesses before, usually timeline, you know, you give yourself 12 months. We, we, did, we had to do this in about three weeks. We didn't really have an end-to-end -end process because this was unprecedented. We hadn't done this before. Certainly didn't have a team as such. Interesting story, when I first came into Test and Trace, I said to um, Baroness Dido Harding, how many people are working in the commercial function? And we thought it was around sort of 50 people. So I went on a call across the thousands of people that were working in Test and Trace. I said, I think if you think you're working commercially or procurement or in the supply chain, please join this call. And I had 650 people turn up. So we kind of, there, there was a, a, a bit of a difference there, but um, absolutely was able to, to bring those people and their capabilities on point. Didn't really have any infrastructure. We were borrowing bits from DHSC, from NHS, NHS Digital, Defence, uh, a whole sort of government model of how we're actually going to run this beast and this programme. But we needed not only just to set up the commercial function, we needed a really flexible contracting model. So this was, this was commercial contracting like has never been done before in government, other than the Second World War. This was, this was completely different for us in terms of the speed and the agility and the scale that we needed to move at. I mean, we put in place a thousand contracts, over 600 suppliers in 12 weeks. So just give you an idea of just the intensity of how we built that up. Uh, you know, we had the challenge of, of, of the pipeline. We had hundreds of projects waiting that we knew we needed to set up, whether it would be a new car park, whether it would be a new lab. And of course, so you know, getting all of the supplies and all the contracts in place, that pipeline was very challenging. And, and balancing that urgency with being really responsible for how I spent the public purse was incredibly important. Uh, I'm sure there'll be questions about the amount of funding, but the whole time, myself and my team, the number one thing was, we will do this in a compliant manner. We will do this in a fair and a proper process that gives value for money of the taxpayers, because you're all going to want to know what we spent the money on, of course. We had a constant changing landscape. <sighs> you know, what we thought we were doing on Monday and we thought we had a clear plan, would have changed by Wednesday, without a doubt. We had lots of um, different interventions. So when I first set up Test and Trace, we didn't know whether we were ever going to have a vaccine. We didn't know. The vaccines were still being worked up by our wonderful, wonderful colleagues in, in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and so as you start adapting, you think you've got a plan in a crisis mode, but you're constantly adapting as you go through. The volatile demand was really difficult for our suppliers. How much do you need, Jackie? I don't know. I don't know how, how long this is going to go on for. How much do you want us to build? How much do you want us to make? How do we set the pricing? It was, it was incredibly, incredibly challenging. And of course, my last sort of, one of the big corporate challenges was the Prime Minister. Um, he, he, you know, uh, we met with him daily, and daily there would be a different plan. Now, this is not a criticism of our government. It is where we were at the time. Number 10 um, were absolutely phenomenal in terms of the speed um, and agility and the way that we, we, uh, we went through this whole process. But prime ministers do sometimes have interesting ideas that you need to follow up. So personally, a challenge for me. So me and the team, we had intense scrutiny on us. We still have intense scrutiny on us from the public, from uh, corporates, and indeed the media. So I've never known a programme that has had so many NAO reports, so many PAC committees already. The opposition in, in, in the Commons, it's the, job, the opposition's job to oppose, but they made my life hell, <laughs> you know, as, as you'd expect the opposition politicians to do. And of course, there's an awful lot of legal disputes on us, and that'll continue. Uh, were things done fairly? Were things done? Was it jobs for the boys? I could, I could write an entire book of it. The media was absolutely relentless on the persecution of test and trace. And we really couldn't understand why, because everybody was outside clapping NHS, and we are NHS. 
We're NHS Test and Trace. And yet the media decided to uh, vilify us and just completely put us as, as, as a shambles. I remember um, being warned that Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain was going to have the Exco um, up behind him and Susanna with the big shambles fire them all. And my face would have been up there. And, you know, uh, Dido Harding and the rest of the team were incredibly resilient. I thought, well, I always thought I'd get my 15 minutes of fame. Didn't quite think it would be that way. Fortunately, something else happened. I can't remember, something sporting or whatever. And they decided not to run with that story. But it was tough, right? It was really, really difficult to continually work under the pressure we were. Um, yeah, at times we felt like the whole country was against us. And, and, that, and that was tough when you know, I've, I've listed out what we've actually done. The team were burning out, without a doubt. Um, we were working, and we don't wear this as a badge of honour, seven days a week, 18-hour days for months on end. And that isn't just the people in Test and Trace. That's our NHS. That's the people in PPE. That's the people in ventilators. That's many of you, depending on the environment and the industry you were running out. So it was a real challenge to lead these individuals especially when you're exhausted yourself. Um, so that, that was a great learning for me throughout that time. We had the extra challenge. Of course, I'm doing all of this in a lockdown environment. No one's actually you know, really in the offices together. Everybody's remote. Uh, and then I had my own personal challenge when my son um, got very, very ill last Easter with COVID and was placed on a ventilator. And we didn't know if he was going to make it through the night. And yet I was still having to drive and run, test and trace. Um, and, I, and I remember coming in the next morning and um, Dido and, and the Secretary of State and people were like, well, you know, why are you here? You know, you need, to be, you need to be with your family. But I couldn't be with my family. We couldn't be with, with our son. We couldn't go anywhere near the hospital. We had an allocated time to call. And again, this is not a criticism, it's a, a reflection. And so, as I said at the time, the, you know, I felt useless as, as, as a mother and a parent. I felt absolutely useless to help that situation. But then I wasn't useless because I was actually driving Test and Trace. And so everything I did actually even made me work even harder. Fortunately, Nick did pull through. Um, he's still, he's still um, on a path of recovery. It's going to take a long time. He's quite a young man, fortunately. Um, but as I say, we've all got our personal stories as well. So what are the lessons learned? What, did, what, have I, what have I personally learned from this? So I'll talk first of all about the government. What did the government learn from this? Well, we weren't ready. People quite often go, oh, you can't say that, Jackie. Well, absolutely. We were not ready for a pandemic of this size. We hadn't scaled up. We hadn't trained. We hadn't invested. We hadn't done contingency planning to the level that we needed for this pandemic. And so one of the lessons there is we need to be ready going forward. Whether it be a pandemic, whether it be another terrorist attack, whether it be a uh, conflict through warfare, we've got to start looking at our national resiliency. We've got to start taking this very, very, well, we do take it seriously, but in the planning. We've got to look at our critical infrastructure that is required in order to be able to be resilient as a nation. We've got to look at our stockpiles. We've got to look at you know, making sure that we've got enough warehousing of the right equipment should we need in scenario planning. We've got to make sure we've got robust supply chains in place. One of the key things in our supply chain was the ability to make the tests in the UK. We really didn't have that ability, so I was very reliant in the early days, um, and still am, on tests being made overseas. That creates quite a big risk to the UK. So again, where is our own sovereign manufacturing capability in order to, to relate to these kind of, and, and respond to these kind of crises? And risk management, you know, we've got to implement a real thorough risk management capability that has looked at each of these scenarios and is part of our cross-government drumbeat. Data modelling, uh, we set up the joint biosecurity organisation, which is a wonderful group of incredibly intelligent analysts, mainly came from Kew, um, but they are, they are the people that sat and analysed 24 hours a day all of the numbers. They were the ones that you see every day uh, when Chris Whitty does his next slide, please. But it was a really quick response. We had to do that very quickly and very effectively. And as a result of that, the government, without a doubt, had to make decisions based without all of the data that we should have had. So we've got to focus on data modelling and getting that right going forward. Um, our partnerships from the outset... 
When we first started this, it was quite centrally driven just because of the nature of the, the crisis and the response. And it soon became very clear that we needed to bring the local authorities, the NHS, the private sector, the public sector, the not-for-profit, the industry leaders. We needed everybody at the table there. So it was, it was a really key lesson. And the devolved administrations as well. You know, running something out of London doesn't necessarily work when you're in, in the, you know, lossy mouth in Scotland or you're, you're somewhere very remote in Northern Ireland. So again, bringing the devolved administrations into the process. And, and you know, from a government perspective, you know, we learnt that we can be really fast, we can be really agile, we can be really effective and we can take risks while still being compliant. So from the commercial team's perspective, what did the commercial team learn? Well, you know, the suppliers were just outstanding. They were rock stars, without a doubt. Um, everything I asked of them, they came forward, they delivered. Um, they were the reason why Test and Trace was so successful, not a bit bunch of us civil servants. And so, I, as I've been preaching for many times, get your suppliers at the table right at the beginning. You've got an idea. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm talking government here, but I've got an idea. Um, I want to do X, Y, Z. Why do I think we have the capability and the experience to plan it out? Then we'll get the, the supplies in later. And that didn't happen in a crisis response. They're there. So that was a, a brilliant, brilliant lesson. Uh, we can put in place really intelligent contracts. Government, we get accused sometimes of being not a bit risk adverse and a little bit stuffy with some of the contracts and the way we contract, um, you know, and, and, and some of the output based contracts. But we were putting in place some really dynamic, exciting contracts, and we need to continue with that. We needed a flex in our contracts. Our contracts are so rigid. So that when I suddenly needed to flex up and flex down, you know, I, I just, it, it, was, it was a real battle for us. So again, going forward, we need to make sure we've got that flexibility. Um, don't be afraid of direct awards. That's quite controversial. Um, direct awards have got their place, and they certainly have their place in a pandemic, um, in a crisis, but they also have their place in every day to day. Everything should be competitive, open and fair, but direct awards have definitely got their place. And trust in your frameworks. Our frameworks were phenomenal uh, in terms of the frameworks that we'd already set up across government. And then personally, um, the lessons that I learned, resiliency. Um, I've been in resilient uh, situations before that required resiliency, but, but not like this. And so how do you be resilient? Well, you have to put that balance in place. I needed to ensure that I knew when to switch off, when to sleep, when to take my dogs for a walk. My dogs were absolutely the salvation for me. Just, just, just go, go and walk the dogs. Uh, celebrating the wins. It's very hard to celebrate when you're in the middle of dealing with a crisis where people are dying. But it was really important for me and the team to recognise when we'd done something absolutely brilliant and outstanding. So celebrate the wins and don't beat ourselves up on the things that didn't work. We were trying things new every single day. Um, I bought the, I, yeah, the A-team. Uh, it goes without saying. I bought the A-team around me. I always try and have the A-team around me. But absolutely in test and trace, we, we did. Um, and just keep everybody focused on the mission. That was the key thing. You know, why are we doing this? What is it for? Keep focused on the mission. And then, as I always said to people, especially last summer, don't tell people what you do. Don't tell them down the pub. Well, we weren't allowed to go to the pub, but even last summer, because everybody had an opinion. You know, as soon as you, they usually do when you mention you work for the government, but if you say you work for Test and Trace, oh my goodness, whew, it would come on. And you do, and another thing, um, and also don't watch Good Morning Britain, because that, that, that was, you can watch it now, but, but uh, peers used to affect my mental health, without a doubt. So I'm going to close there, and I hope that's been quite useful, taking you on that, that journey and talking about some of the challenges and some of the lessons learned. Um, I think, you know, in reflections of, of now that we're hopefully getting to a much better place with managing this virus. It hasn't gone away, we all know that, but managing it. We've all got choices as, as industry leaders, as commercial procurement supply chain professionals. We can kind of almost, because I know we're all fed up of it, forget it didn't happen and kind of move on, or we can all take the decision to what did we learn and how are we going to take that quite dreadful situation and really, really transform our industry and, and the way of doing things. 
Um, we've, all got the, we've all got the opportunity to do that. And as I started, you know, each and every one of you, we can either learn from it or we're condemned to repeat it. Thank you. You didn't need slides, did you? <laughs> I distract. Uh, look, we've had loads of questions come in. Um, another brilliant session. Um, I'm going to ask one first, which is simply, what is your proudest achievement from the Test and Trace programme? Oh, that, that's, that's really quite, quite difficult. Um, my, prou my proudest achievement is, is the team, is the team that we pulled together and the team that we've still got together. Um, and what they've come through and the resilience that they've shown and the continued dedication. I'm incredibly proud of that. And I'm also just incredibly proud when, you know, whenever we look at sort of how we're really impacting how we're going to live with this virus going forward and all of the things that myself and my team have done to, to ensure that, you know, we know so much more now than we did a year ago. And, and I could talk for, the, for hours about each of the individual things that we either bought or we provided or how we supported the clinicians. Um, so, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm really, really proud of Test and Trace. Yeah, and you should be. Um, right, any questions from the floor? Yes, could we just get a microphone across here? If you just state your name, please. Joe. Thank you. My name's Joe. Um, I oh. work for BMG. Uh, I'm fascinated to know you clearly developed amazing um, intellectual and, and procedural agility and rapidity to deal with what was going on. How do you bake that into the longer term in government mm. so that those really strong positives are retained um, and with time they're not sort of eroded and lost? Absolutely. And so a couple of things that we're doing. Well, number one, I've got quite a loud voice. And so, I, you know, there, there are quite a few of us that are going to make sure, because we have got a seat at the table across government uh, in terms of our commercial capability going forward. We had um, a report... Um, uh, that uh, a Boardman report, which is absolutely phenomenal, it's on the government website, if any of you wish to look at it, which looked at how we, how we responded to the whole COVID pandemic from a procurement perspective. So it covered tests and trace, vaccines, PPE, and with really, really good recommendations. So we've actually got a dedicated plan now, a blueprint for how we're going to implement all of the things that were, were, were um, discovered in that report, plus other things, uh, into the way of going, because as I say, the biggest travesty will be if we don't do anything about it. Okay, one more from the floor, please. Hi there, my name is Claire. Huge congratulations. The country owes Test and Trace a debt of honour, honestly. Thank you. I think one of the things that strikes me that the, it, it really sets Britain up as an innovative, push the boundary kind of culture. And how do we take in the question here by government, but how do we take that forward to really stand on the forefront of pushing the boundaries and making sure we are known for our competitive advantage in that kind of innovation? Yeah, and that, I ask myself that all the time because in crisis, I think it was um, uh, somebody earlier said, you know, to take advantage of a crisis, uh, but we don't want to keep having crisis um, in order for us to really transform. So I think, I think there's two ways. I've mentioned what the government's response is going to do and, and we'll publish those findings. We'll publish the blueprints and the plans that we're going to do in order to continue that innovation and pushing the boundaries. But you know, my ask to suppliers and the industry is keep pushing us back as well. Uh, you know, I, I, the worst thing would be for my suppliers now, having been at the table and having had the opportunity to bring their expertise to suddenly be put back in that place where they get brought in once I've, you know, once I've got a, once I've got a contract I want them for all to bid for. So again, I think it's a two-way thing. I think it's a two-way partnership. Um, and I think, you know, I just keep encouraging industry to keep talking about this. And it's, I'm not sure it's now because I think people are quite tired People are tired and people are, are fed up. And so if we started running lots of think tanks and organize, you know, workshops with, with supplier management and, and all our different and SIPs, you know, I've been talking to SIPs about this as well, procurement leaders, having this conversation, 
We are going to do it. We have to do it. We, but, but again, it's just getting that timing right. It'll probably be the beginning of uh, 2021 uh, is my plan. And I'm just going to keep pushing that because I think, I think it's really exciting. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. But Jackie is going to be back with us in around half an hour for our final panel of the day. So please do uh, come, back, back, come back for that. But for now, Jackie Rock, big thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie.